We are planning a, a session with the four speakers in the order that you see there. Uh, Professor Shimon Ullman from the Weizmann Institute, uh, Computer Science, uh, Hagai Bergman, Professor Hagai Bergman from the Hebrew University, our Parkinson expert, uh, Professor Olaf Blanke from the EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique at the, in Lausanne. Uh, he will tell you about some amazing things, and our young camer, uh, Dr. Amir Ahmedi from the Hebrew University, will tell you about sensory substitution. Uh, so I'll give you a seven minutes, very fast introduction to the, to the issue of augmenting cognition. I'll explain what does it mean to augment cognition. I will tell you that in the 21st century, one of the most challenging things uh, in terms of brain research will be to not only heal the brain, but also improve the brain in order to enable it to, to face the, the, the upcoming challenges, which are going to be amazing. So this machine will have to learn constantly and adapt constantly to the ever-changing environment that it itself generates not to speak about diseases that will be coming, so we'll mention that. So I want to explain to you that in seven minutes, then I'll call Professor Shimon Ullman, and each speaker, if they will behave nicely, they will give exactly 15 minutes talk, and you will have 15, five minutes after each speaker to ask questions. So that's the plan. Do prepare questions, because the whole notion here is really to interact with you, rather than to have a monologue and go home. The interaction is very important, so please really ask questions. You have a one of a lifetime a, a chance to speak directly with the, spe with the speaker, so please do it. Uh, <clears throat> and if there will be time left at the end, we'll have discussion together, but I doubt it. So let's start. So in the last 200 million years, there is this phenomena of the mammalian. We are part of the mammalian world, and this mammalian world is about 200 million years old. And during these 200 million years old, we generated, we as human beings, as homo sapiens, we generated an unusually big brain relative to its own body weight. So in terms of brain as a size, we have other animals that are bigger than us, for example, dolphins or elephants. But relative to our body weight, this is the biggest brain we are aware of. That's the biggest thing, is not the, the important thing, but it's part of the thing. The fact that we are big in terms of brain is part of the uh, capability to generate new things, but this is not the only thing, and we'll talk about this in a second, what makes us so unique? Why is our brain so unique relative to other brains, of the chimpanzee, for example, that we generate all the time new things? Just to tell you that our brain in the last 100,000 years genetically have not changed, so we are the same genome like the, the early Homo sapiens 100,000 years ago. So we as a phenomena, a very young phenomena, 100,000 years old, and all this yellow, yellow part, so these are years, all this yellow part is the, what we call the cultural evolution. This is a period where there is no genetic change in the human sapiens, but still we generate completely new things constantly. For example, written language in the last 5,000 years. So language and math is a new phenomena of this old brain, old in terms of 100,000 years old. So we are constantly generating new things, like mathematics, science, uh, computers, and we are also trying to understand our own brain. So this is an amazing phenomena, that the brain itself is generating tools to understanding itself, not only understanding, but changing itself, not only itself, but its own genome. It's a very unusual phenomena. We don't know of any other brain who's doing it. Uh, just to tell you not to be worried, but your brain is becoming less weight, less heavy with time, not now when you listen to, when you hear the talk, <laughs> but, but, but on average along the years, you can see that the brain was on average about 0.5 kilograms. It's less now. We don't completely understand why the human brain is becoming shrinked. Doesn't matter because you see, we do amazing things with the shrinked brain. But that's, that's, a, fact, that's a fact that you could discuss in another, in another session, not today what is called the structural plasticity of the brain. Structural, the change in the anatomy of the brain with time. I'm not going to talk about this, just to let you know, your brain is not going to change, but the next generation will have a, a little shrinked brain relative to you. <laughs> so this brain is doing amazing things, really. Absolutely shocking. All these things that we can do, 
you know, Einstein and others, thoughts, creativity, imagination, art, mathematics, science. But on the other hand, this brain is doing other things that I want to discuss in a second. The, this brain of yours, like all mammals, have a unique thing, and a unique patent. We can say like an inventful building block. It's called the cortical column. So below your skull, in the cortex, this, this convoluted sheath of neurons have this kind of blocks, building blocks, repeatedly building blocks. Each one is about a cubic millimeter. This is called the cortical column. This is an invention of the mammals. We don't know of this structure before the mammalians. This is a new structure. We have it, mouse have it, monkeys have it, cats have it. Lower animals do not have it. And this is the first focus of the modern research in many ways. Not only, of course, because there are other parts of the brain, as Haggai will mention later, but the cortex is something very unusual for, 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 for the mammalians. So we are trying to understand this column. We know today to simulate in the computer this column. So this is what happens in a millimeter cubic in your brain. A cubic millimeter in your brain looks like this. About four kilometers of wires, about billion, 10 to the power of nine connections. This is the fundamental building block of this relatively new region, the neocortex. So now you are diving into a cubic millimeter in your brain. We have to understand all this in order to, to, to change the brain, to manipulate the brain in diseases and so forth. So the diseases is, of course, the main issue because as we get older, as we expand life, uh, we, we, we see more and more of these terrible uh, diseases. We know today of, a, I mean by names, we know today about 560 diseases are named, neurological diseases are named. And this is, of course, a huge suffering to the human being. I'm sure everybody or every one of you know uh, that, that there are these diseases. He knows it from family or friends and so forth. And, and it's certain that it's clear that if we are going to expand life, and we do, the expectancy is that about the end of 21st century, we will live on average more than 100 years on average. This means that all these amazing, terrible diseases will come up and we really need to, to solve it as brain researchers. We cannot allow ourselves to have a, a, a community with half people uh, suffering from diseases like that. So, so, so that's, that's the main issue, that's the main challenge, that's the main force that we are all putting in brain research towards the 21st century. We, we, can, we can talk about two aspects, the brain repair, repairing the diseased brain, you will hear about that today but also to augment the brain capabilities. Because one thing, as I showed you before, is that with this same brain, we are changing all the time, constantly. For example, after this talk, you are certainly not going to have the same brain as you came in, if you will remember anything that I was just saying, or anybody else. So that means that physically your brain has changed. So this is a fantastic capability to change constantly with the interaction in the environment with new challenges like GPS, with new challenges like iPhones and computers. And the challenges are going to become amazingly intense, really intense. We will have to adapt to all this if we want to, to go on living in this adapting and changing world. And this is called basically the brain We are trying to find ways to enable the brain to be able to prepare itself, to be ready to the changes that we, our brain itself, is, is causing. The new building, the new GPS, the new telemetric communication, and so forth. So this is, this is the whole issue of brain augmentation. How do I intervene with the brain? Either by education, or by medication, or by electrical stimulation. How do I intervene with the brain to enable it, or do I want to intervene with the brain? How do I interact with the brain from the outside? to enable it to expose, to express, to be able to challenge itself with the new things that are coming. So this OG-COG era, augmenting cognition, OG-COG era, is the era that we are in, in terms of brain sciences. It will Im impact every one of you. And so that's the session today. It will discuss the issue of augmenting cognition, both in disease, but also in health. I just want to say that we are optimistic that we can learn the brain, understand the brain deep enough in order to be able to, uh, to repair it when it seeks, but also enable to use what we know, what we've learned about this, and, and, and make it more adaptable, more plastic, 
more capable of changing. And this is par partly because of these new technologies. I'm not going to go into details. For example, the Brainbow technology, it's a new technology that enables us to look at the brain in a colorful way, so the brain is not going to be any more black and white or gray matter. It's a colorful matter today. We can generate mouse in this case, mice that are colorful. It's called the Brainbow technology. And this enables us to study the brain in a much, much better anatomically and also physiologically way. And this is the reflection of what I just said. This new technology is reflected by many, many new brain centers in New York, in Jerusalem, now built by Norman Foster, in, in Lisbon, the Champollion Center in London, and so forth. There is now 10 new buildings being built today for brain research in a very different brain research that we used to. It looks like this. A center of brain research today will not be anymore a biological center. It will be an integrative center with physicists, computer scientists, engineers sitting in one center, interacting together to really solve the issue of brain research in general, but augmenting cognition in particular. These are the speakers that I mentioned before. As I said, Shimon Umland from Weizmann will talk more about intelligent machines. Professor Hagai Bergman about deep brain stimulation in Parkinson and other diseases. Professor Olaf Blanke, as I said, is speaking about cognitive neuroprosthesis. Cognitive neuroprosthesis, this is very interesting. And Amira Mehdi is, will tell you about how can we see when we are blind, so to speak, when we are blind, how do we see through the years? So I'm inviting Shimon Ullman to give his 15 minutes talk. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, while this is being prepared, I will talk about the cooperation between brain and intelligent machines. And this is an area of study that progressed over the last several years at an amazing speed. And I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, what has been happening and what we can expect in the future. Uh, as you will see the slides, the, the initial plan was to talk in Hebrew, but I realized at the last moment that uh, while I was here that there are many people in the audience uh, who are probably uh, uh, may have difficulty with Hebrew. So I will talk in uh, English. Some of the slides are, are, are exclusively in Hebrew, but I think that as I present them and explain what's going on, people who cannot follow the Hebrew, uh, cannot follow the Hebrew writing in the slides will be okay. And Idan, if you, where are you? If you can give me a two, two minutes warning. Uh, oh, there is here. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. So, um, the study of the, the attempt to create machines that will be intelligent and will be able to, to think on their own started from the very early days of uh, the pioneers of computer science. I will mention in particular Alan Turing. This is the uh, picture of Alan Turing. Because now, this year in 2012, all over the year, all over the world, it's, the, uh, it's called the, in computer science the Turing year. He was a fundamental uh, pioneer in the field, and we are celebrating 100 years to his, uh, to his birth. And he was one of the, while he started uh, many of the theoretical aspects of computer science, uh, together with this, he was an early pioneer of trying to build machines that will rival the, the human brain. Um, things started slowly, but the question I want to examine now without giving a conclusive answer is, are we now uh, at the start, at the dawn of a new age of truly intelligent, uh, truly intelligent machines? We already had a number of great successes throughout the recent years. Uh, perhaps the most, the best known one, um, which really made a splash in 1997, where uh, the computer called Deep Blue, constructed by uh, IBM, managed to beat in international competition for the first time the uh, world champion in chess, in chess Gary Kasparov. Uh, the score was two to one with, uh, with three draws out of six games. So uh, the machine became for the first time the best playing uh, system uh, on our planet better than uh, the, the, uh, the world champion. Uh, this was extremely impressive, but at the same time, there is something limited about it because chess 
is a very specific focus narrow domain uh, and the question is uh, can machines do something which is closer to the human brain which be very flexible creative learn new things and so on which is not what uh, deep blue was able to do so after uh, the years since 1997, I think that the biggest splash, uh, just because of the limitation I, I mentioned uh, right now, came last year in uh, 2012 when a machine built again uh, by IBM called Watson became the world champion in uh, a game called Jeopardy. And those of you here who come from the States will uh, probably recognize what uh, this is all about. Here in Israel, most people maybe didn't hear about Jeopardy, but it's a very popular uh, uh, television uh, game, basically a, a quiz, uh, uh, and it's completely open, so um, uh, almost any question can be asked. The questions are difficult and tricky, and it really takes a subtle mind and, and, and a lot of intelligence to be able to play this game well. Uh, so IBM decided to build a machine and then to openly put it on the stage. And you can see here uh, two human beings and one computer. This is connected to a computer. There is no person there. And are con competing neck to neck. The uh, question is being read out. And whoever answers first wins points. And so the, uh, uh, the thing continues. And uh, after three days of intense competitions, many, many questions being asked and answered, uh, the computer won. Watson became the uh, world champion in uh, this open, uh, open game uh, and um, proved that machines, intelligent machines, can uh, deal with very open, flexible domains. Let me give you one example uh, of a question that actually happened during this competition. Uh, it's written here in Hebrew. In May uh, 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary uh, of the arrival of this uh, um, uh, traveler to India. Uh, the answer, I don't know how many of you immediately know the answer. The answer is Vasco da Gama. Uh, Watson answered it in a split of a second. And the interesting thing was that there was no explicit mentioning of this fact uh, in, uh, in Watson's database. There were bits and pieces in various ways. For starters, you have to uh, walk back and understand that it's a 400 uh, b uh, birthday, so you should go 400 years earlier and look for events at that age and so on and so forth. Uh, everything came together very, very quickly uh, and uh, Watson did, uh, did it uh, immediately and better than, the, than humans. Now this is a game, but you can imagine what this kind of ability can do to real systems. For example, IBM is now applying it to medical diagnosis. And you can think about going to a doctor and just imagine that you know that the doctor has such a system helping him that anything that was even written in the field of medicine about a particular disease you might have, it's there, the doctor may not know about it, but the machine will and will make the right predictions and connections and so on. So that uh, really can be a very, very helpful thing to have in real life. So this is up and coming, but if you think about it, we have already intelligent machines in our daily lives. Uh, Google search and other search engines are, are quite intelligent. Uh, another example, a small example, but a telling one, in, uh, in the States there is a uh, video renting service uh, called Netflix that rents out videos and it makes very good recommendation. It guesses what each person is going to like. And this guesses what different people, what people like based on a variety of parameters uh, is a complicated issue. Here is a, showing you a part of the formulas inside of how this Netflix made it, makes it guesses of what people are going to like. So it's a complicated domain. And if you think about it, being able to have models of people and being able to predict what people are going to want and to enjoy uh, is a very interesting capability. Last example, just because it appeared uh, last month, f just a few days ago in the New York Times, uh, there was a system which was put to work in the, uh, in the uh, school system in various places in the United States. The, uh, uh, News, uh, newspaper piece was called The Algorithm Didn't Like My Essay. It's an automated system that reads student essays when they finish high school and grades them instead of uh, human uh, graders. Um, a thing which is close to my own area of investigation is being machined, building machine that will be able to see. 
We all know about cameras that can recognize faces. There is a new camera out there that can recognize pets, for example, and it can shoot a good photograph of your cat or dog. Uh, it's really uh, already in existence. Uh, there is a technology now in new cars uh, doing driving assistance. Uh, can warn about uh, the driver from obstacles, of, uh, other vehicles, pedestrians, and so on. Uh, it's interesting to note this particular one because uh, perhaps the leading company in this domain serving companies from uh, BMW and uh, uh, Volvo and Honda and many others is an Israeli company uh, called Mobileye, which was developed by Amnon Shashua, professor at the uh, Hebrew University. It's, it's a, uh, it's a leading company, the leading company in this, in this domain, and this is just the start. People are now experimenting with driverless cars. Uh, there is a car there which does not have a driver and can uh, drive uh, along the road, uh, and people are talking about it seriously, that if they're not too distant features, as future, this will be sufficiently um, uh, mature, this technology, to think about you know, a blind person entering a car and telling the car, take me to work, and uh, it will be able to, uh, to do it, in hospital as well, and so on. Now, the study or the development of intelligent thinking machines is a collaboration between two major uh, areas of science, brain research on the other hand, and computer science uh, on the other. So these two together are deeply involved and intimately involved in the science of creating intelligent machines. And the interactions go, go both ways. The brain teaches us about possible ways of what intelligence is and how to build machines, and machines are helping us uh, to understand in a new ways, uh, construct theories, and understand in new ways uh, the information processing uh, that is going on uh, in the brain. This collaboration between brain and on the one hand and computers on the other uh, is, has really taken off tremendously. To give you just one example, there is now in Europe, the, there is a competition for, what, for a mega grants, for mega projects, two huge projects. Each one will be a scientific grant that will uh, receive one billion dollar, uh, euros uh, to, to run the research program. Uh, there has been first round, there are six finalists in this competition. And two of these finalists, one is uh, uh, a large-scale simulation of the, uh, uh, of the human brain in supercomputers, and the other one is the construction of uh, intelligent robots with human capabilities. Um, one reason, one um, a change in recent years that is one of the driving forces behind this uh, emerging tight cooperation between brain and computers our new abilities to image and see the brain in action. The, uh, until recently, the ability to see and investigate, study the human brain has been pretty limited. Most of the brain studies have been conducted on animals where experiments can be done. But with new techniques, we can now image uh, the human brain in action. Uh, for example, using this machine, which is called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is a sort of an MRI machine, but the little F in front, this F, uh, stands for the word functional. It, what it means is that rather than seeing the structure of the brain, uh, you can see the function of the brain, which part of the brain is now active. So I can tell you, you know, inside this machine, think about a particular poem by a poet you like, and you will see which part of the brain this poem sort of exists and uh, activated when you recite your uh, poem, this poem to yourself. Uh, through this machine, one can see maps of the entire brain in action, and you can see here what the scientist looking at the machine while the person is in there and performing a task. One can get maps like this, which give you in real time the full activation of the entire brain. And an amazing thing that has been done recently, this is used for many, many, uh, for answering many, many interesting questions, but one, in particular, which is interesting to see, is the ability to reconstruct the human sensory experience from the brain activity. So what we see here is what scientists have done, showing a person an image. In this case, is this uh, French policeman or whatever this uh, image is this. But the experimenter doesn't see this image. The experimenter just sees this map of the human, the subject activity, the subject who is looking at the image, uh, the brain is activated, this is the brain activity, and having 
read this brain activity, it is now possible to reconstruct what uh, the person was actually seeing, uh, and you can, you can see the quality of the reconstruction. So this is what uh, was reconstructed from the brain activity. Uh, here is another example, and there is a full movie, a person which, watching movie and the reconstruction. Um, so this shows how one can now understand and interpret some of the, at least some of the brain activity, and it brings in interesting questions. For example, would it be possible with this technique to read out dreams? Because during dreaming, you know, nobody knows from the outside what you're doing, but recording brain activity and performing this kind of reconstruction, maybe we can follow in real time and see how a what a person is dreaming about or thinking about. So you can see that this is a two minutes. Okay, uh, so this is the next to last slide, so it's the time is working well. Uh, an area I'll just mention very briefly, but just to show you, it's not something that we have made a lot of progress in, but it's something we are starting with, the scientific community, but showing you sort of the ultimate of what kind of interesting things open up. Uh, when we look at the brain, one surprising thing was that how, how, how the brain activity is divided between conscious aware activity and unconscious activity. It turns out that a lot of activity, when you're thinking, looking, and so on, can go on in the brain without you being aware of, what, uh, uh, of what's happening. So some brain activity leads to consciousness and awareness. Some other brain activity, for some reason, does not lead to awareness and consciousness. So the whole business of can we look at the brain distinguish between the uh, states of the brain that lead to conscious awareness, those that not, and get a handle, start to try to understand um, how these subjective experiences, consciousness and so on, uh, can come out, uh, out of brain activity and consider the fact whether intelligent machines of the future, uh, can we expect that they will have some sort of uh, awareness as well. So to sum up, what's next? Uh, in the near future, it's clear that intelligent systems will enter our lives more and more. They will have larger and larger influence on our society, on our economy, and so on. And as I said, these uh, advances will come from a tight integration between brain science uh, and computer science. So brain centers or scientific centers that have this uh, collaboration will benefit. In the Further future, it's clear that system will become more and more intelligent, more and more clever, and in many domains will probably be more clever and more intelligent and more capable than humans. We will uh, uh, come to count on them and trust them more than we trust our own judgment, like in the medical diagnosis I, I mentioned before. Um, it's unclear, uh, but an interesting question, will they ever develop any kind of uh, uh, awareness similar to the kind of awareness that exists in our own brain. Uh, and finally, what will be the long-term uh, influence of such a situation on the individual psychology and on society when we m live amidst machines which uh, are as intelligent as we are, and in some cases, maybe even more. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> I'll be more than glad to take any comment, question. Yeah, at the back there. I'll just speak up so that people can hear. Okay. Uh, she asked, what, what are, are the dangers? I think basic, especially when uh, in light of the last slide with all this, you know, living along this highly intelligent machine or uh, just the slide before that, that one can look into a human brain and in some sense see what the person is thinking about. That's a, it certainly has some scary parts. And I think this is like many scientific discussions in a way it goes beyond science. I mean, there are tremendous things. We can, we can increase intelligence, we can help people, we can solve problems, and uh, there is a lot of promise and people are excited about the great promise. Like in many uh, great inventions and scientific advances, there is danger. Invading privacy, uh, using it for the, wrong, uh, um, for the wrong purposes. And as I also mentioned, even without using it for the wrong purpose, just what it does to the psychology and to, to society living this completely new situation. There are dangers, and I think that's it, it, 
one conclusion from this is that it's not just science, but these things should be discussed, and that's one reason why I think for us as scientists are really glad to discuss it and bring it out to the open and, and, and tell it to, to the public. It's not just because we are happy to talk about our interesting work, which is certainly a part of it, but I think it, it's really an important mission, if you want. I think that these issues should be uh, discussed, and this presidential uh, conference is certainly a good place to, uh, to do at least a little bit of it. Yes? So the Israeli connection, Israel is a really a leader both in the theory and I think in the practice of these things. In Israel, both in Jerusalem, uh, the Hebrew University, at the Weizmann Institute where I come from, uh, they for many years now, they were very early on in this wave of co connecting uh, theoretical computer science and brain research. And Israel is considered uh, uh, a leading country among the, uh, the scientific countries of the, of the world. In fact, Idan may know that better than I, than I do as a, uh, as a person who is involved with the ICNC. It was selected in Europe as the best uh, uh, educational program for students in, 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 brain, in, right. in brain and computation, right? So there are many programs in the world studying, combining brain and computation. There was some evaluation committee and they selected the Hebrew University one as the best in, the, the, the best in existence. So, Israel is, is leading, or is certainly in a leading place, uh, in, along with, other, of course, other larger places, uh, and in the applied applications of this as well. Uh, I mentioned, for example, uh, uh, Mobileye, the uh, computer vision company, but it's not the only one. Uh, and the centers are, are very helpful in making this larger, and in particular, bringing back good people, which is a major, major thing. We have some wonderful Israelis out there uh, if we can bring some of them back, it would be, it would be great. And this is part of what these centers are doing. Yeah? Talk about intelligence. What about wisdom? I think that uh, the one thing that is the most important thing is thinking outside the box and not just reading chess, but rather having some uh, creative thought and things that might um, be more complicated. I agree, and I think that we are not there yet, but I think that the huge jump between uh, the two big successes that I showed, the, the sort of the chess and this jeopardy, and the jeopardy can really exercise some interesting judgment. It's still not, not, uh, um, uh, it's still not an automated uh, scientist and so on, but it's, uh, it's really impressive. People, if you ask people in the field, when IBM started at the, uh, working on this project, whether they will, it will manage to win Jeopardy, my bet is nine out of 10 would tell you no way, that uh, it's too difficult. So even we are surprised that the rate that things are going, uh, 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 are progressing. So we'll see, you're completely right that these are the uniquely hum human and important aspects of the brain, but uh, I see no limitation, things are <coughs> getting there. I'm sorry that we have to Sorry, she will be outside, we can talk maybe later. Sorry. Right, so thanks again for your... Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, as I Dan say, I do believe that we are machine, but we are machine with a soul, with nefesh. And uh, actually, the main question that I'm asking myself and we are asking society, are we able to treat the disorder of the soul 
and can we provide a, a medicine to those patients that suffer from not only from neurological disorder, but also from mental disorder like severe depression and schizophrenia. And uh, to do so, uh, actually I'm going to start with one of the most classical neurological diseases that we are very familiar with, Parkinson's disease, and then I'll move to the mental disorder. So Parkinson's disease was discovered about 200 years ago. We are very familiar with this disease because, with this because it is very common actually, uh, sorry, because it is about uh, uh, one out of any hundred per person in the population above the age of 60 that has Parkinson's disease. And do we know the disease? The main symptom for the disease that we are very aware are the tremor, the patient is tremor, but even more severe are the akinesia, the lack of, the lack of voluntary movement, the fact that the patient will sit near his table like this and will speak very, very slowly and will not interact with the environment, will not get outside. This is the lack of voluntary movement, the akinesia, the lack of kinesia is the most severe uh, problem that we are facing with Parkinson's disease. And it took some time, but eventually, it was discovered that Parkinson's disease is caused by the death of a specific group of neuron in the brain, the neuron that create the neurotransmitter dopamine, and this was discovered in about uh, in the, in the uh, first half of the 20th century, and eventually people were taking this discovery and say, if dopamine is missing, then we can cure our patient by giving them back dopamine, and this was coming actually in the 70s, and dopamine replacement therapy, when we give our patient dopamine in order to cure their Parkinson's disease, is the gold standard of our therapy today. However, we are facing problem with dopamine replacement therapy. For the first five to 10 years, it's great, okay? But then after 10 years of treatment, most of our patients will develop the side effect of the dopamine replacement therapy, and they will have too much involuntary movement. They will move all the time, like J. Fox, that probably you've seen it on, on, the, uh, on the TV, and so on. So, the dopamine replacement therapy is great for Parkinsonian patients for the first 10 years, but after 10 years, we need something else. And eventually, the story came, uh, the second stage of therapy for Parkinson actually started about 20 years ago when we have used a monkey model of Parkinson disease. And this, in, in this monkey model, we've shown that by inactivation of a small part of the brain, the subthalamic nucleus, we can cure all the Parkinsonian symptoms of the monkey, the lack of movement, the akinesia, and the tremor, and we've been very, very happy with this. And three years later, this was taken to the uh, operating room of human patient. And you know, one movie is better than 1,000, uh, uh, than many, many uh, words. So what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a movie of one of these patients, and you can you you, you can see uh, soon the patient to so. Are you playing? Okay, great, thank you. And uh, uh, you, you see now the patient before the surgery, the way it looked before the surgery. So you see the tremor of the end. You see the shuffling, very, very magnetic uh, stepping, the way the patient is walking, severe difficulty in turning around. And now you will see the same patient after the surgery. And this is the patient, okay? And. Uh, uh, of course, this is the best typical example, okay? This is done by the Metronic company, okay? But uh, <laughs> uh, 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 this is what we call best typical example. But, <laughs> but eventually, okay, can, can you get back to the presentation? 
Uh, but eventually, this deep brain stimulation neurosurgical treatment for Parkinson's disease uh, is now actually our standard in the uh, United States, Europe, and Israel of treating Parkinson's patients with severe Parkinson's disease. In Israel, it is part of the national uh, health program, so everybody can get it. All over the world, more than 100,000 patients have been treated with this, sur sur this kind of surgery. And here in Jerusalem, we've done more than 400 patients uh, by now, and there are other programs going on. So at least one, at one part of, uh, uh, or one disease of the brain, we've been very, very well, doing very, very well with deep brain stimulation, with electrical manipulation of the activity of the brain, and we are able to provide, a, a, I would say, an op for patients with Parkinson's disease that cannot tolerate anymore the dopamine replacement therapy. The only problem with a deep brain stimulation program is that it is not easy to manage the patient then after. What we do is that we are putting these four electrode contact into the brain of the patient, and we have the wire that is going be below the skin, so you don't see the wire, to a pacemaker that is located over here. And then the patient is coming to the neurological clinic, and the poor neurologist has now to find the optimal parameter in order to cure the patient. And he has four contacts to, to play between them, and the, so it is a four contact. He has a many other ways to change the parameter of the stimulation, the voltage, the pulse width, the frequency. So eventually, the, there are many, many parameters that the neurologist can play and find to find the optimal way for the treatment. And neurologists are very, very good. So they are doing it very, very well. But then the patient is going home, and the patient is coming back only three months later to the clinic. But Parkinson's disease is not fixed for these three months of treatment. So eventually, we are not giving the optimal treatment to the, for the patient all the time because the patient is coming only every three months to the clinic. So the way that we came to think about it is, is actually that we should find, look for the technology and learn from technology for the optimal way. So of course, one can, what, one can use op, open loop system in order to control the temperature of this room, okay? So you can have a fire or a fan, but much better, you have a thermostat. And a thermostat actually you set the temperature that you would like the, the room to be over here, and if there is a discrepance or mismatch between the actual temperature and the setting temperature, then you apply either cooling or heating to the system. So this is closed loop feedback system. And actually what we believe that this is eventually the computational goal of the basal ganglia. Because the basal ganglia, the role of the basal ganglia is all the time to look for the mismatch between your prediction and reality. And whenever the reality is worse than predicted, then the basal ganglia are trying to improve, to change your behavioral policy such to, uh, that you lead to optimal trade-off between gain and cost in your behavior. So if this is the role of the basal ganglia, if these are the tricks of the basal ganglia, we should be able to exploit it and to use it for human patients. And indeed, actually, uh, what we've done is again going back to the monkey, and in the monkey, we've created a model of Parkinson's disease, the same model that we've used 20 years ago to, for the subthalamic nucleus inactivation, but this time we treat this Parkinsonian monkey with closed loop deep brain stimulation. So you can see over here the amount of movement that the Parkinsonian monkey is doing. The Parkinsonian monkey is doing very, very minimal movement. This is what we give today to our patient. So it clearly helps. The, the monkey is moving more. But using closed loop adaptive stimulation, the monkey is much, much better. And there are many, many control. And we, we see this improvement in many, many other parameters. So the bottom line of this paper was very, very simple. Closed loop different stimulation is superior in ameliorating Parkinson's disease. Very, very clear cut. So what we should do now, actually, it is very, very clear from our point of view. We should find the optimal multi-level 
a system that will be able to adjust in order to uh, cure our patient. We should, we should do it in human patient, and it would be very easy to convince the ethical committee, because if we close the loop, we can always open it and come back for the uh, open, loop st the open loop stimulation with the standard of today. But then, maybe, we should think about other disease. And the other disease are the mental disorder. And the most severe mental disorder for me is schizophrenia. One percent of the population, starting at the age of 25, and we don't offer their treatment. We can control their positive signs, okay? So we can avoid them, they are not shouting in the street but we put them in hostel and we are not giving them the option to go back to society. And this is for a monkey model, this is for a monkey model of uh, a schizophrenia that we have some kind of what we call the neural signature. And actually, I believe that if we have a neural signature of the negative symptom of schizophrenia, then we can move and even try first in the monkey and then in the, in the human patient. It is not easy what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting now to go for a psychosurgery. For a, if I'll be successful in the monkey, then the next step probably should be try it on human patient. And we are very, very aware of the really terrible history of the frontal lobotomy. Frontal lobotomy was done because of the same frustration that we are facing today, even in the 50s. People, there have been too many schizophrenic patients that society was unable to cure them. And these people that today we treat them as devils, but reading their paper and reading their memory, they were really trying to help the patient by using the frontal lobotomy in order to cure schizophrenia. And today we think that sh this should not be done and it should not be cured. So how can we learn the mistake from the past and avoid it when we'll offer psychosurgery in the future. So I think, yes, we sh being very, very well of this problem, we should, nevertheless, we should do it. And we should do it because brain disorder and brain disorder or mental disorder are a major burden to our society. They are not only economically, these are the main source of suffering. It is not a cardiac disease or a kidney disease, that it is you that fight with the disease. The mental disorder patient is losing itself, okay? He's losing the self, he's losing the ani, the, the, the identity of himself, and therefore, for me, these are the most devastating disease that we should offer some kind of treatment. And we know today that pharmacologically is not working good enough. And this is clearly quite clear. Brain main activity is carried by electrical signal. So from time to time, we can use pharmacology. But clearly, if we'd like to interrupt with the brain, then we should use electrical activity. And I, this is what is written over here. And therefore, using a, a deep brain stimulation should work much better. And, and finally, today, okay, unlike the frontal lobotomy, Deep brain stimulation procedure are uh, rever re precise, reversible, and adjustable. There are minimal side effects in, in good ends, uh, uh, no bleeding, no infection. And therefore, they are, in my opinion, the optimal way to move forward in treatment with this, of this patient with mental disorder. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the last uh, slide. And again, as I said, frontal lobotomy uh, was, uh, is considered as uh, a, a kind of a treatment that should not be tried anymore, okay? And I completely agree. And uh, uh, this is uh, from, again, it was said that, let's say by Tom Waits, uh, that I would I, I'd rather have a button in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. And I would say, yes, okay, but would I, or one that I care for, would have a severe uh, a mental disorder, I would uh, uh, really think about closed loop adaptive deep brain stimulation because they are reversible and adjustable. They have minimal side effects. They are based on, this is the last one, they are based on good understanding of the brain. 
And I think this is the ethical point of view. We, a society, today should take the patient point of view, not the society point of view. So we don't care about the caregiver or the family. We will care about the patient. And with good evidence-based medicine, we'll be able to do a good job in the help our patient. Many thanks for your attention. Hagai, uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? I don't think that yeah. any... The question was if we we'll use this uh, method for senility, there is already ongoing uh, trial in Toronto of using similar method, not adaptive, but, clo but different stimulation for Alzheimer's. Okay? So people are already trying it, and I would believe, again, I am, I am much more concerned with schizophrenia than with Alzheimer's, okay? Because I would say, yeah, although, although most of us are already in the age that are more in risk for Alzheimer than in schizophrenia, we as society are offering much better, much better treatment for Alzheimer patient than for schizophrenia. But yes, I would use it for most brain disorder. And then, actually, I think that uh, this is a very tricky question, we would use it in order to augment cognition of normal, uh, uh, of, of what we call normal. This is much behind my ability to answer. But uh, so in the meantime, I'm tr just trying to kill you. So, so Brainwave is a company that is using transmagnetic stimulation uh, in order to do, uh, and uh, we are very familiar and we are friends, uh, and of course the dream is to do it in a non-invasive way. I would say that it will take much more time because the ability to use non-invasive deep brain stimulation is still very, very limited. So maybe in the far away we'll be able to use different tr tricks without uh, invasive therapy. I would say that in the next uh, generation, we should go to such invasive therapy, but clearly in mind, the less invasive the method, the better it is. Another question, I think, is a little uh, uh, related to the You mentioned DBS as a measure, and you mentioned pharmacology as a second measure. Can you say some words about the stem cells? Stem? So stem cell, probably uh, many of you have heard about the success or the artificial success that uh, we have been reported uh, 20, 25 years ago with treating Parkinson's disease with stem cell. So giving the patient stem cell that will manufacture their dopamine. We don't need to give them pills. They will be able to use their own stem cell. Unfortunately, this study has been declared as a failure. It is not working because the stem cells were doing much more dopamine than necessary, and many of these patients actually need different stimulation. So today, at the present technology, stem cell therapy is still very, very experimental. It is somehow in the midline between this different stimulation and ph pharma treatment, and I think that we are waiting for the future. It is very far being back in the human uh, theater. Thank you very much, Magai. Thank you. <laughs> so, our next speaker is Professor Olaf Lanke from EPFM, Switzerland. Olaf is a visionary, if you will soon coming, such a long way. Not so long. Enjoy very close, very close. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, and uh, tell you about, about research that we're doing at a new center uh, at my university in Switzerland, which is dedicated actually to augmenting cognition, but also mobility and, and perceptions, a center for, for neuroprosthetics. What I would like um, to do today uh, is about tell you about two different aspects of, of what we're doing in my particular 
research laboratory. One part is, is science, so we're going to talk about um, how the body is represented in the brain, how have we and other researchers looked at this in the past, and then one particular aspect that came in the last talk, that the notion of self was mentioned. So we believe in the lab that understanding this body representation will be very helpful also to understand scientifically what it means to have a self. And I'll give a definition in the next slide. And then within this center, what really I, I try to develop and with, with my colleagues there is a form of cognitive neuroprosthetics that doesn't really exist yet, but we want to basically, by what we understand here, manipulate and controlling aspects of the body representation of relevance for self-consciousness, project this to machines, artificial uh, limbs and robots uh, eventually that we've also seen in the, in the first talk to be mentioned. So the subject of self in cognitive neuroscience, it has been studied, as you know, for, for, for 2,000 years. Philosophers initially, psychologists very recently, and now neuroscientists, uh, particular cognitive neuroscientists and computational neuroscientists are, are looking at the, the problem of the self and the related aspect of consciousness. But it's one of those things that everybody in the room what it is to have or be a self, to be somebody, but when you then have to define it, or I have to define it, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing that is like, like consciousness, very, very difficult actually to define, and then that everybody would agree on. Uh, uh, agree on. So, so this is one definition that I find very helpful to just get started. The self is, is, is you, can, you can see two aspects. For, first of all, physically I'm different from Amir, who is sitting uh, in the first row, uh, so I'm different from other social beings from, from the same species. I'm also different from the environment, this chair for example. So the self is this entity that is really different, or we have this uh, conscious experience that we're different um, than people and objects around us. But then there is this, this mystical thing that we're this entity who is having thoughts, who can reflect about myself, about other people, and also actions. These are my actions. These are my left hand movements. I'm the one generating these. But of course it's my brain generating these. So what is it in the brain that leads to this sensation? Well, that it's actually me and, and, and what is this me that is doing this? Cognitive neuroscientists, and this would take up the next 13 minutes I think at least if I would uh, go through this, don't worry, obviously I will not uh, do this, but people have studied visual recognition. If you look each morning in the mirror, for example, people have thought um, that this is a nice way to understand the self. They have looked at memory, thought, language, intentions, social aspects, but all these, in my opinion, just look at sub-issues of the problem. We've, we started looking at one particular sub-aspect of the problem of the self, which is body processing. How do I move my hand? How do I feel my body? And what's the relevant for, for the self? And I show you one illusion, instead of more words, how this can be tested, uh, actually in the research lab. And actually, a notion that we all have that this is my hand, or this is your hand in, in the audience, you, you would say probably, well, I can't get it wrong that this is my hand and not somebody else's uh, hand. But neurological damage actually suggests that this is a frequent a disorder, a relatively frequent disorder in the clinic, but this is even more striking in all of us. We could induce this illusion very quickly that we don't recognize our own hand as being, as being our hand. So basically what's, what's happening here in the video is this is the, this is the subject that is studied. There is an, uh, a, a screen here that occludes his hand what you will see is that the experimenter applies a touch cue here, but at the same time as this ridiculously looking fake hand, could be a robotic hand in the near future, there is another touch cue that is applied, but that's only seen, okay? So there's a conflict with respect to what you, what you see in, uh, in real life, called the rubber hand illusion. <laughs> So in, they're even having fun in the research lab. That's very good. Maybe he has not so much fun. If you repeat this experiment, I show it one more time, not because it's so great, but it's really, if you look, the aggressor is coming from here. But what is introduced is a link, a trick. The brain is tricked to believe that this fake hand, that he uh, actually is his left hand, right? He should pull away this hand because the aggressor is coming from here. He pulls away this hand because the brain creates, erroneously, links between this hand and this hand. And in normal life, of course, if you see and feel a touch, it's always at the same position. What the researchers do here in the rubber hand illusion, they create a conflict. They put 20 centimeters in between, and then if you feel the touch at the same time that you see it, you believe that this is, is um, your hand. So this is called the rubber hand illusion. There's two illusions. Why is this called an illusion? Well, the fake arm, is this hand here, feels like your own hand. So if you ask people to rate 
that the fake hand feels like my real hand, this is rated very highly in this condition. Also, you feel the cue that you see applied, you feel it really as if it was applied to your real hand. Okay, so you get these two things very quickly wrong. One minute of stroking induces this. There is a recalibration. If you're asked to point towards your real hand, you make errors. Your brain does not find its own left hand anymore after one minute of stroking. Although on everyday basis, we always think that this uh, uh, should always be correct. It is not. And the brain regions involved, I briefly showed you them here. This is functional fMRI that was introduced, can be used to find and define the brain regions involved in this. Now, what we have been interested in the lab, I will be brief on this, is define or do two things. First of all, we want to induce the illusion in an automatized way. We don't need anybody else stroking. We want to have a, a, a simple stimulation method applying the stimulus. Um, then we provide the virtual hands, not fake hands, over a virtual reality display, and then we can do many, as many conditions for as long as we want, and we have been able to show that much stronger illusions can be induced in this, in this state. Uh, we can on also go on to move uh, to analyze brain signals online while the subjects are involved in this paradigm, and we have recently built, together with the computational neuroscience group at EPFL, a Bayesian model, a model that accounts for what the subject, how the subject will behave. In our particular interest here, what is perceived as my hand or not. So it's not the subject who controls this, it's us as experimenters who can control how the subject will uh, react in those methods. But I started out by trying to come up with a model for the self. This entity to which things, perceptions, and actions are ascribed. But what I've manipulated in the rubber hand illusion is actually how a hand is ascribed to this entity, to me, yes or no. So we're not studying the entity, actually. So in this line of work, we actually go a step further, is the main part of, 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 of the lab, and we try to come up with a version, not a rubber hand illusion, but a sort of rubber body illusion, a full body version. Can we do similar illusions for a full body? And so what we, what we developed is a sort of avatar virtual reality setup. So you see a camera here. Now the experimenter is standing here. The person with a uh, a white shirt is now an experimental subject, and now the subject will not receive stimuli on the hand, but on the back. As you can see here, I think there's a sh short video on this as well. There's also more, more of this on, on, on YouTube, uh, if you type virtual out-of-body experience. So there's a stroking stimulus now applied here. So this is just like the stroking stimulus at the, at the, at the hand, but now what the subject is seeing, because the subject is wearing a head-mounted display, goggles, and all the subject is seeing is what the camera is seeing. So the subject is standing here, but actually sees the body, the own body, two meters in front. So there's the same distance that we have between the two hands that we now exploit for the full body. And uh, you're not surprised maybe at this point to find that if you apply the stroking here at the same time, then you see it, there's a very strong illusion that actually this avatar's body or this, this virtual body that you see is your body. So what works for the hand now also works uh, for the body. And I was very happy because if you imagine we have to induce stroking and automatize stroking patterns for each finger, for the hand, for the arm, we would have to do a lot of stroking devices. This is a minimal version that seems to shift and distort our own full body representation. Okay, because if you change this representation, the hand representation is also likely to be changed. I mentioned there is a recalibration. So how well are subjects localizing their body? What we were actually to find here is that this person will not indicate where the self is localized, namely here, but it will be drifted several tenths of centimeters in a predictable direction, a recalibration towards the avatar's body. So the brain starts really identifying with this body, self-consciousness, but also we can measure this behaviorally that they actually, the brain starts thinking to be two meters uh, in front. We have done several other studies um, looking at what happens to brain processing during this illusion. Just two quick things. If we apply a touch cue to the back, you perceive them less well. If you apply a painful stimulus to the body of the experimental subjects, they endure more pain. There's pain analgesia. So these also for applications to patients are interesting conditions. Time is running fast, so I skipped. <coughs> there was a robotic setup that we, uh, that we developed here using an fMRI scanner, we, we, we build a robotic system here replacing the mattress that allowed us to do our condition also using a brain imaging. What we could find is that there's a dedicated region here in red that is activated and distinguishes whether my brain localizes me here or at Idan's position or at another person's position. Depending how far this is, how this is manipulated, this brain activity puts us at a certain position in space. 
So having normal activity here puts me into my body in the first place, and this is an ongoing active brain process. This is not just this region. You see other regions shown here in blue are also activated. And uh, this was interesting for me. I'm an MD by training, neurologist. We initially started launching this line of research by studying patients with so-called out-of-body experience, which have exactly what we've tried to induce by these stimulation techniques. Namely, pa patients with out-of-body experiences feel to be at a distance of two to three meters from their body. So this is actually holding the system between neurological data and with data from cognitive neuroscience. The self is often considered, and this is the science conclusion, a very uh, mysterious or great, greatest mystery of the human mind. Actually, these data show that we should not wait another 60 years before studying it. It actually seems to be quite simple to study it, more simple than we, we thought. And what I want to focus on in the next part is how can we use and exploit this capacity to control our full body representation in order to augment and, 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 and control artificial robots and bodies. So this comes then to the part of cognitive neuroprosthetics, um, the projection of self-consciousness, these aspects that I've just presented to you, self-identification with the body and calibration of where I am in space to computer-generated avatars, robots eventually, and probably what will happen, happen first, uh, prosthetic devices and artificial limbs. But I will start first we're telling you about a project that is actually ongoing. The first people actually on this planet who are already using and extending their bodies uh, to incorporate tools are actually uh, tools are, are surgeons who are using minimally invasive uh, surgery devices. This is the system that we have available uh, in Geneva where the surgeons actually stop operating. And what we're studying, um, you can see a system here, is when the surgeon sitting here is driving a robot that is inside a patient's body. You see the surgeon sitting here. Normally the surgeons used to have their hands inside a patient's body. Now all that is inside the body is this minimally invasive a robot that is carrying out the operation. There will be a video soon. What we are interested in is to follow up actually on data that come from neuroscience which have shown that once you hold a tool in your hand like this laser pointer, it becomes part of your body. The brain starts treating the tip of the tool as the tip of my index finger. Now, now with these huge robotic tools, we have the possibility to see whether this metaphor actually is, is consolidated also by neuroscientific data. This is activity in parietal, parietal cortex, and I, I've used this system myself. It's very intuitive. Seeing these devices that you will see in a second feels like as if you are manipulating with your fingers in that different entity. But what does this mean? These are new tools that we never used before. One prediction for, 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 for this, uh, this meeting could be that there will be new brain regions already particularly at work, and I'll stop this nasty video in a, in a second, but this is how the surgeons operate now and will probably operate in the future, and you could operate, of course, a patient at a, at, a, at a far distance. But what we are interested here from a neuroscientific point of view, is this going to be a new kind of hand and a new function and a new brain region in parietal cortex? More down to earth, maybe phantom limb patients and amputee patients, like this patient with a right upper limb um, uh, amputation, feels the persistence of a hand. So there's ownership. This is not just a random hand. This is his hand, perceived like this. And he feels this hand. There's touch cues. Now, how we know already that this presence of these phantom limb sensations that sometimes lead to phantom limb pain actually are linked to differences in how your brain is organized here in primary somatosensory cortex. Now, I've mentioned before that we have this automatized version of the rubber hand illusion, and there is work here by, by Todd Kuiken from the University of Chicago where automatized form haptically controlled rubber hand illusions are induced in phantom limb patients and amputee patients. Look at this patient, upper limb amputation. There's the stump here. Tactile cues are applied here in an automatized fashion while the fake hand, a prosthetic hand, is receiving touch cues. So this line of research will actually, once these are fully connected to the um, human body, be able, whenever the artificial hand will touch a certain device, will be sent over these interface structures, two brain structures that actually record and, and encode in you and me um, when we really have our hand touching um, a physical entity. So this is yet another version. So in my concept, the right design of this artificial limb will be very similar to the right design for robotic surgery. Both are tools that the brain very easily incorporates into its body representation. And if this is incorporated, we'll probably have, have new functions because we can then start also in the, robot, in, in the surgery case, for example, not just have one arm, but several arms. 
30 seconds. Okay, so I, I'll be finished after this. I just wanted to finish also with entertainment and maybe some uh, industry applications. So two applications that I mentioned were for the upper limb. One application that I see also is computer gaming and video conferencing. For example, if you think about the projection of, um, of the avatar or of self-consciousness towards the avatar that you've seen on the, on the video projection, what about video conferencing where everybody would project selfhood to an avatar and we one could meet and interact into this scenario. Actually in computer gaming this is ongoing in so-called first person perspective games and what one idea that we're pursuing not just of course in this line but also with respect to robots and exoskeletons that will be able to support um, um, and human walkers is that either in the simulated way you see there is once in a while you see the hand a first pe uh, perspective, uh, perspective computer game you see that this is kind of exactly the same scenario that I've shown you, that if we apply this additional stroking, the brain starts believing that you are actually this red figure that in this computer game, first person perspective, is actually your body. So you could project this to this one body, but also to additional bodies. And I thank you for your attention and look forward to your question. thought um, Israel is the, is the country of technology, but let me tell you how we do PhD defenses in Switzerland. So many people don't come actually in this video conference for PhD defense, which is really increasing a lot. Um, so, so sometimes in the video conference is good, you actually do have the feeling that that person is there. Of course, this is my part, but I think if these kind of technologies are improved um, and people are giving up on the idea that everybody really has to physically be there to, to do such evaluations and, and many other interactions, this will be more and more happening. I think video conferencing and how we interact over, instead of being on the telephone is just one, one example. What is missing is the neuroscience of the computational part. Yes, sir. Now I understood you correctly when you say that the tools which cannot be integrated into our own personal bodily image are, in a sense, impossible. Therefore, we could not have them I, I think, um, I, yeah, I, I think we have to see what is not possible. There will certainly be certain tools that are, that are not possible to incorporate. On the robotic tools, it looks like pretty impossible, but once you use the system, the robot feels just like a, a, an arm. An interesting question for research is how many arms can our brain actually incorporate and represent in the brain? I think we may not be limited to two. And Hollywood shows us uh, non scientific examples, of, of course, of this, but I think um, 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 the human brain probably has a power to incorporate more than just four limbs. Actually, there's patient examples, I, I probably don't have time, but there's a case of supernumerary phantom limbs after brain damage. So these patients will receive two or three left arms after brain damage. If it's, if it's necessary uh, to, to, to lift uh, 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 devices, uh, why not? I mean, if you think about a crane and, and, and what some of these robots do, they're not built on the, on the, on the, on the, of course, the human body, but I think it's a nice potential that we don't exploit it. Thank you very much, Robert. Great question. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a newcomer, but actually I'm an old comer because I studied in this program, so it's a huge pleasure and honor to speak in front of my teachers, Haggai and Idan, and in front of scientists like uh, Olaf and Shimon, so, uh, and in this uh, presidential conference. Since I'm young, I would only try to entertain you a little bit uh, for 15 minutes and see how far we get, but I'm going to talk about a serious issue. And I'm going to talk about seeing with the ears, hands, and bionic eyes. And I'm going to talk about the problem of blindness. We know that there are 40 million people that are blind worldwide, uh, severe visual impairments. And when I'm talking about severe, I'm talking about real difficulty to, re to see anything that is on the screen is increasing. 
In, in the entire world, we're talking about over 300 million people, especially with age, age diabetes, etc. So this is also a serious issue. And we also use it, and I'm, I'm standing here, but actually I'm representing my team, and I hope to highlight some of the, the people that are contributing to this work. We are, uh, um, will try to use it as a tool to understand the brain better. And I would actually start, this is just sound check, I would, just, I would actually start with this. I think in the, as the first slide will be a, a little bit vague, but I think very quickly during the talk you would see where I'm heading. So the common wisdom, one very uh, central thing that if you still open in 2012 uh, any neuroscience textbook, is that the brain is a sensory specific machine. So we know, for example, we have a brain dedicated areas in the back of our brain that is de dedicated to vision. Then here we have a brain part and lobe that is ded dedicated to audition and we have for a touch and the body like we, sh we saw in uh, Olaf's uh, uh, talk. And this is not just a theoretical thing and a theoretical theme, but also a practical theme because, uh, for example, we have the Nobel Prize, uh, part of the Nobel Prize to Jubel and Wiesel was because of their and better understanding of critical periods. And the idea that if you don't get an input to one eye during a critical period or a sensitive period, you would never be able to see again, even if you fix your problem. And if you didn't get the input for both eyes, you would never, it doesn't matter what we will do, what magic, what medicine, whatever we will do, this, this person would never be able to see. What we suggest uh, is that actually uh, there is a different organization principle to the brain that offers some hope for visual rehabilitation but to rehabilitation in general. And uh, basically the co this common suggests suggests the brain is a highly flexible, sensory independent task machine. So the critical thing is what are the tasks the brain is facing? And it will be able to adapt but only with the right technologies and training. And these critical periods may be reopened and visual abilities restored. Okay, so this is the, the underground current of what I'm going to talk about today while trying to entertain you. Why do we have this strange way of looking at the brain? Just, I, I don't have time to explore all the evidence from our lab and from other labs, but uh, I will highlight one example. For example, what you see here is uh, an area in the back of our brain that uh, uh, Idan mentioned, reading developed uh, about 5,000 years ago and people like uh, Stanislas Dian and Laurent Cohen found that part of the visual system in the back of our brain is dedicated to process reading, like reading this text on the slide or book or whatever. And this is, what is amazing is that it doesn't matter which culture you're coming from, what uh, system, the activation will be highly precise, less than half a centimeter across the entire people if you do some adjustment of the size of the brain, etc. So this is highly re replicable uh, phenomena. It doesn't matter how you read, in which language. W while you're doing the vision, you have the visual system light up in a very precise area. And what uh, Leo Reich in, uh, in, uh, in our team showed is that when you give blind individuals that were born with born blind, so they never saw a one photon of light in their life, read using touch, using braille, then it's not the somatosensory system that is specifically recruited. It's the information passed through there, but the main brain area that is doing it is this the same visual so-called word form area. So actually, this is not a visual area. It's an illusion because vision is so good in doing reading, but if you read it during a different modality, it will be exactly the same activation. And actually, this is an image, if we show it to any visual war form or visual scientist, it would say this is a sighted person reading by vision. But no, this image actually is the group results of all the blind that read using touch, using the hand. So maybe the reading is really a bizarre example. You know, maybe this is just one example. But can we generalize it to other functions? Let's start in vision. And in order to do this, I would have to tell you one thing that probably you already know after Shimon's uh, talk, uh, but it's, I think it's very important because um, most of the people in, uh, would do a parallel between how vision, our visual system works and a camera. 
Okay, so it's, you have uh, the lenses and you have increasing the light and decreasing the light, etc., etc. So it, the periphery is very similar. But our system in the brain, our visual system is very different. And it's creating in a very active way our images that we see. And what is outside in the world is only part of the story. Uh, so for example, how many of you, if you saw it uh, for the first time, see, and this is for five minutes, we'll have, we'll have an interactive thing. Okay, so we need your participation. See here black images on white background. Just raise your hand. So, e excellent, you're not blind, so that's already good. Now, those of you who can see only black patches on white background, uh, keep your hand up. Those of you who can see something else, you can uh, leave your hand. So about a third of the audience can see here only black patches on white background. Now, if I will tell you to those people that between each two patches there is actually a letter, now your visual word form would start kicking in and would read this. And what is written here? <laughs> Lift. Now everybody can, can see it. Is there anyone that you, you still can't? So you see it. Perfect. So I can move to the next slide. So the bottom line is that something changed in the way you process the world and you create an image of the word lift here. So it's an active thing. Another example which I really like because it happened to me spontaneously. Uh, after that I read about it, but uh, apparently this uh, FedEx guy, so again, you read this, you have your visual word from area working. But actually the guy that, uh, so, so how, uh, all of you can read this, right? Any of you can see, but don't say anything loud. Anything of you can see something in addition? Okay, so uh, about third of, uh, half of the audience. So what happened to me is that you look on this and you see only FedEx and then after 100 time you know that I sent paper and they are rejected and we send them again and they are rejected again <laughs> and I see the truck on the street and I just saw the FedEx. One day I realized that they hide between the E and the X an arrow and actually they, they were winning a, a, a design award for this because they, it's actually we tell you okay we bring your stuff in time etc etc okay so again and now those of you did anyone here didn't see the arrow before in the audience? So about half of the audience didn't see. So actually, just like Idan said, at this moment, I changed your brain. Because now, if you want to ignore this arrow, it's not doable. And actually, even more so, each time now you go in the street and see this truck, you remember me and this <laughs> boring lecture. Okay, last example is this example, uh, and again, it's uh, dedicated, it's, it's to show you that you ha we have a dedicated brain area to process faces. But this dedicated brain area, it's not just that we have a brain area or a network that process faces, it's a very particular network that was carved during evolution. And the brain actively creates this. So for example, here you can see that these uh, two Mona Lisa, all of you can recognize this is Mona Lisa's, right? And some of you which have really good uh, vision and active visual system might see some changes, differences between, you know, we had here that Siur Shvuila Yeled in, uh, you know, to, to find the, the tiny differences. So, but there is some differences in the mouth and in the eyes. And actually what I'm doing, uh, what I will do, you know, people don't really believe this. Well, this is a known uh, phenomena, but people that see it for the first time don't believe it. So I'm rotating only 90 degrees and now I'm fully rotating. So this is exactly the same image like this, okay? And the point here is that now this is a really ugly Mona Lisa and this is a really pretty Mona Lisa, okay? And even though I'm going to tell you this is exactly the same, now you can't see the ugly Mona Lisa anymore. You can see it's a slightly different Mona Lisa. This is because evolution created this network for upright faces, because this is how we see people. You know, we, we go in New York in 2 a.m. in the 80s, we need to know if this guy is going to kill us or we need to go to the other side of the street, but then maybe the car will go over us, etc., etc. So the point is that we actively create the images in our visual system. So if this is true, maybe we can use it to help to blind people. And I won't have time to go over all of this, but the pioneer of this field was Paul Bacharita uh, in the tactile domain and in general, Peter Mayer in the auditory domain. But the idea is that you wear a camera, the camera I would see instead of you, you would hear or being touched, like in Olaf's case and in our case, in an auditory case. And your brain would create the images, okay? That's the, that's the theory behind it. And if you would create these images, you would see, quote unquote. 
Now, if you want to see this uh, setup, you're welcome actually to the LSEC and Hebrew University boot. We are going to show this as well as other technologies to blind, if I don't have time to show you all of this. But the bottom line is that using a set of rules, and these rules can be very simple, we can represent all the pixels in sound, okay? It's uh, very difficult to understand, but so I will just give you, I would skip all this, but I will give you just one example or two examples. So for example, here we have a very simple image. We have these uh, rectangles. So if, ta if something is black, you don't hear anything. If something is white, we have sound. If the sound is in the upper part, you hear high tones. Beep, beep, beep. And the sounds, in a way, represent the topography in vision. This is not how usually the auditory system works, but in using this algorithm, it can work, OK? Now, also concepts like if I'm fat or thin can be represented very easily. In this case, fat line or thin line, OK? And the fat line is longer in time. And as it got thinner and thinner, it's shorter and shorter in time, OK? So these simple rules basically give you a way to interpret the sounds. Can the blind now really learn? Actually, what I'm doing usually here, we don't have enough time, but I would actually present to you a word in English of scanning the image from left to right. OK, so for example, how many letters we have in this word? I would play it two more times. Can anyone tell me how many letters? Three, fantastic. Can you tell me something else about these letters? Fantastic, you are very good. So the first and the last one is exactly the same. Now, since I, uh, there is some hope, although I didn't do the training because I don't have time. Very close, very close. So W is the first, and the first and last repeat. You are fantastic. Although I didn't train you, you were able to read a word. By the way, I'm going to talk for half a second about bionic eyes. So bionic eyes is just a tool like uh, Haggai presented to go inside the system in some cases, for example, if you lose your receptors, <coughs> and stimulate it. The, mo the most advanced bionic eyes we have today can do reading of one letter or one word after one year in several minutes, or in one or two minutes. So it shows you just how intuitive it can be. Now, it's not only what is on the screen, it can also tell you that this word is now up on the screen and now low on the screen. So where the things are is very important because we want to act upon them. And finally, it can also tell you the sizes. So the, if you're very good, you can hear it's the same thing, just smaller and cuter maybe. Now, more seriously, what can the blind do with these things? So for example, first they just learn the rules. They come to the lab for 40 hours or 70 hours. Then they learn lines, etc., cetera, and uh, junctions. Then they can recognize this is a phase and this is a tool, but they can't say which tool. And then they can also say which object it is and even which facial expression. Uh, so I would show you here, for example, just the gist of this uh, program, uh, uh, how we teach blind to, for example, do like I did for you teaching to read, simple things. In this case, the, the this is a congenitally blind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> learning so to, first of all, the features of faces <laughs> in front of the computer. נראה לי שגם מגבות מופיעות. מעולה, כל הכבוד. בוא תנסה עכשיו ואת... העצוב זה השני. יפה מאוד. Now then, then we move from 2D training to real-life training. And you can, one question that people ask, if they are doing it, they don't be able to hear again. But our brain is actually amazing. It's, it can switch in a milliseconds from one thing to the other. So you can see that she is talking with us while she is touching Ella's face, while she is listening to the sounds in the training phase. Now she's not touching Ella anymore, the pitch is at least this project, but looking at her and she needs to know what she's doing. Okay, and she can even do facial expressions. 
So you hear this bizarre sound, now you can't say anything about it. But if you come to the lab, and that's actually universal. There was no person, late blind sighted, that came and wasn't able to, to learn this. <coughs> 40 to 70 hours. So not too long, several weeks. Depends how much energy you have. And now generalization. A different person will come, and she will be still be able to, to do it. Okay, one minute. Uh, just to recap, what's going on in the brain while they learn to do this? So what's going on is quite amazing. And actually what we do is now you're experts on fMRI and uh, EEG and TMS after this talk. We actually scan their brain while their sounds are meaningless. Then we scan their brain after two hours of training. So it's not enough to change, to create new synapses. So it's how the brain learn like you did without changing, creating proteins and synapses, etc. Then we train them for 40 to 7 hours and scan their brain again and in several other points and we see how actually the brain completely changes and rewire. Two very quick examples. One, this is the, again, the visual word form area that we shouldn't call them any more visual form, word form area. We should call them word form area because we do it in braille. When the sounds are meaningless, these auditory sounds, this area is not activated. This is an example of one person. But now when we teach the sound to these individuals, then it's activated both by Braille and by the soundscape. The last example I'm going to show you is the Object Recognition Center. F also from the Weizmann Institute, we have Rafi Malach that found that we have a, a parallel of the monkey ventral stream IT LOC that active each time you see an object. What's going on when the subjects learn to recognize objects, tools, uh, this laptop, etc.? Then this area in the beginning, the activation all goes to the auditory cortex and it's unspecific, but once we recognize objects, it's go exactly to the same network. So actually we're talking again about a task machinery to decipher, for example, the 2D or 3D surfaces of objects and recognize what they are. Um, part of our, the effort of our team is to build new devices. So here we cr try to create, sorry, color vision for the blind and also uh, I won't show it via music. I won't show all the details, but bl blind can also actually act upon it very accurately, just like in vision, to develop new uh, cane for the blind that can sense. And, and again, you are welcome to, the, to, to test it and train on it on the boot, on the Hebrew University LSEC boot. And finally, uh, this is the last slide. We are thinking about using it to teach the brain and, and speed up the qualia that is being created by new prosthesis by combining it with this type of training, okay? So I would finish here and thank my team. I highlight some of the individuals that contributed, but actually all of them contributed immensely to this and other projects, to some funding agency and to you for your attention. <laughs>